afraid how they should bless us all, friends, and help us be wise stewards as we're trying to reach out to the community of your word, Lord, and share the gospel with the news. Jesus Christ, King, come to be this life for you, my peace. We pray that you could bless us all, friends, and bless us with service, and help us, Lord, to pay attention to what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's not forget on the dinner next week, uh, we'll be following the evening or the morning service and uh, please bring, each family bring a main course uh, side salad and bread and something to drink and if you want dessert, uh, bring that as well so that we have enough to go around for all of our members and our family. Let's take our Bibles, let's go over to Ephesians chapter 5 as we continue on with uh, the godly home and the blueprints of a great home. In today and age, if you read the Word of God, you'll notice that there is a standing theme that God is looking for men and women of faith. And this morning I want to entitle a message out of Ephesians chapter 5 as we're dealing with the husbands, is calling for Christ-like men. We need some men that have the fortitude and the faith to stand up and say, this is what the Bible says. This is what we believe. This is what we're following. And I'm not talking about being a man of forceful demeanor and a dictator. I'm talking about someone that leads by example. That leads with passion. People can tell you if you are a genuine follower of Christ by how you come across some people come across like a bull in a china shop. Some come across like a feather. We need to have a mix between both. We need to be firm. We need to be uh, very dedicated to what we believe. Today our men are, in essence, they go with the flow. We need to be a salmon sometimes. As a faithful Christian, we need to go against the stream and say, as for me and my house, I can't dictate what the rest of Christianity does, but as for me and I, my house, we're going to follow the scriptures. We're going to be the family that is pleasing to the Lord. The world is looking for answers. Go into any kind of bookstore. I did not matter. Go to the library. Go to anywhere. And you'll notice that the section on self-help is 
is massive. Why don't we help ourselves and open the greatest self-help book in the world? And that's the Bible. And it'll show us what our self really is. It's not good. There's nothing we can do with self. But there sure is something we can do with our Savior. Amen. And that is what the world says. Fix yourself. You can be a better. Turn over a new leaf. The problem about turning over a new leaf is not on the vine. The other side's going to die too. And this is where we are faced in Christianity today. How do I be real? How do I be the example that my wife would want to follow? But how do I be an example where my flesh doesn't get its way, where it is a sacrificial Christian? But I'm not a pushover. This morning as we look at Ephesians chapter 5, I want us to look at a couple aspects. We've been looking at the characteristics of love and the characteristics of a godly man and a worldly man. But this morning I want us to look at not only the quality of a man in Christ, but I want us to look at what Christ did for the church. I want us to look at how he purified the church, but how he wants us to do the same with our families. There is nothing like a family that has great unity and cohesiveness. There's nothing like going, and we've all seen it, have we not? And I don't have to paint any pictures. We've seen the families at Walmart where the kids are screaming at the top of their lung, banging on the buggies, pension on their parents. My question is, would you want to go home to that? Let me put a definite no. I would not. What, where's the peace? If I come home as a man from work and I want to sit down and my kids are on the back of the couch hitting me with a frying pan, how peaceful is that? My wife is screaming at me uh, and I'm screaming at my wife. Do you wonder why there are so many divorces today? Do you wonder why the kids are so messed up today? But we want to walk back into a home to where the kids are loving, the husband and wife are loving, and they show it. It doesn't mean you're a perfect family, but it means there is unity. That's the home that God wants us to build. The blueprint of a great home is founded where each and every one of us, as the Bible says, are submitting one to another. If we put joy, Jesus, others, and you into the family, notice where you is at on the last. If we put Jesus first, others second, and us last, just imagine how it would change our society. And that's what the Bible offers is hope and a blueprint how to have a good family. One that you are proud of, fathers. One that you are proud of, mothers. And children, one that you're proud of to be involved in. There's nothing worse to say, that's my parents. <laughs> We've all been there. At times we're like, oh, I don't want to know them. They're so uncool. It's different to be uncool than to say, I'm ashamed of them. They're always fighting. They're always at each other's throat. Nothing is happy. And you know what the kids have a picture of? A bad marriage. And this is where we need to give them a picture of what God could do in a marriage. If Jesus is in the center and the husband and wife are on the corner, you have a perfect triangle. But if one is off, the triangle will collapse. This morning as we begin reading in Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church." 
For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Let's pray this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we open thy word, and we teach and preach about everything that we as men should be to our wives and our family. Lord, would you minister to our hearts? Would you open our hearts and show us where we need improvements, where we need correction, where we need admonishment? Use this word, I pray, for your honor and your glory. And I give you the thanks. Be with those that are not able to be here due to sickness or traveling. Bring them back to us. Thank you for those that are in attendance this morning. Would you bless them richly? In Jesus' precious name, amen. As you begin looking at This aspect, one love that you'll see here is not only a sacrificial love that we talked about a couple weeks ago, but a cleansing love. You love your family so much that you want your family to be a pure family before God. Striving for not a worldly clean, but a heavenly clean. You as a father are desiring that your family, not pushing them. If you try to push someone to believe something, They may believe it with their head, but not their heart. But show them. As Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. He didn't say, I'm going to drag you as I follow Christ. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. Give your children, give your wives something to look up to. And I'll be honest, you are human, I am human, every man is human, and your flesh is going to fight you every step of the way, tooth and nail. You get up in the morning and you may have a perfect week of an unmissed devotional. And the next week something's going to come up. You may get up and you may pray. You may have your prayer list. You may have things. The devil does not want you to be committed father and husband. The best thing he wants is he wants your family ruined. But we ought to draw a line in the sand and say this family is off limits devils. It's the Lord's. I am not going to give an inch on my family. And I'm going to fight for its purity. I'm going to fight for its salvation. We ought to get some fortitude and some tenacity, men, and fight for what's important. If your wife is important to you, fight for them. If your children are important to you, you ought to fight for them. We need a Christ-like man. What did Christ did? He went all the way to the cross for the world, even though the world shunned him. Because he loved you so much that he wanted you to spend eternity with him. That's how much Christ's love was. How much is your love for the family? Are you willing to go through life so concerned about our jobs and everything in position in society that we forget about the souls of our family? That is what's important. That is the most valuable asset in your home is the souls of your wife and your children. And if they don't spend eternity with us, what does $300,000 a year mean? Absolutely nothing. What does a million? What does a big home in Toronto with? Nothing. It means nothing in light of eternity. If we should gain the whole world yet lose our soul, what do we have? I would rather be, as James says, rich in faith and poor in this world. I would rather have my children and my grandchildren serving the Lord faithfully than to live in a big house with all the money I need. I would rather them see me praying for the next meal. Amen? Having the faith to say, Lord, like George Mueller, as he was sitting down one day with all the orphans around the table, He bowed his head and he says, Lord, thank you for this meal we're about to partake in. And one of the new orphans says, what meal? There's nothing on the plate. And he says, nothing. He just continued to pray for all the lavish food they're about to receive. And that kid was kind of making fun of it. And another kid leaned over and says, shush, you have not met George's God yet. And now all of a sudden... There was a knock. And just outside the door, there was a man that was driving a lorry. And it was filled with bread and milk. And his axle broke just outside the door. 
And he says, I can't get to the market to sell my ware. Can your children use all the fresh bread and milk? He said, absolutely. The kids ate well that breakfast. They were able to have their porridge. They were able to have fresh milk and fresh bread. That's the faith, parents. We ought to pass on to our kids that if our God says he's going to meet every need, if we put him for, he's going to do it. Don't fret about tomorrow. For you know who holds tomorrow. And he holds it well. Amen. The cleansing love that God talks about. Is God's purifying of his church. Just as you ought to desire a pure family. A family that honors God. God desires a pure church that honors him. Notice how the Bible says. Therefore as to the church is subject unto Christ. So let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it. With the washing of water by the word. God's purpose for us to have the word of God in front of us. Is to use it to cleanse us. So that he can present us before the father. In that becoming day as a spotless bride. How many weddings have you ever gone to, ladies and gentlemen, that the bride has come with mud all over her dress? You would laugh like crazy. We've seen movies and we've seen things where the brides all looks like uh, they just rolled with a bunch of pigs and got out of it. And, you know, we laugh and we joke around. But in reality, how many weddings have we ever seen the bride and groom look like a bum? We haven't. That white gown, whatever color they wear, is spotless. They're the center of attention. Everybody's looking. Her hair's fixed. Her makeup's done. Her jewelry's just immaculate. It fits the whole outfit. And you say, wow, she's beautiful. That's what Jesus Christ wants to do to you. When he presents you to the Father... He wants you to be without wrinkle, without spot, without blemish to where Christ says, this is my bride. I'm well pleased with them. He wants to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's what Jesus, just as we as grooms, if we remember that wedding day, standing there with jitters and nervousness as we see the back doors of the church open and they say, here comes the bride and we're just a bowl of jelly. We're just like, wow. With me, it was like, I can't believe she agreed to marry me. <laughs> but, you know, you, you say, wow, that's my wife. That's what Christ wants us. That's my bride. That's the church that I died for. That's the church I desire cleanliness. And that's why the Bible says we ought to have a positional cleaning. Everyone in the church, we're collectively part of the church, but everyone has a choice. Are you a child of God? Have you accepted the free gift of salvation? Have you been positionally clean? When you are saved, you are forgiven, as 2 Corinthians or Colossians 2.13 says, forgiven of all your trespasses. Everything. Your past is washed away. And every day from there, we have 1 John 1, 9. He is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins. But we're positionally clean. You could be involved in a church. You can be a part of a church. You can grow up in a church. You can grow up in a Christian family. But never know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You're part of a church on earth. But you're not part of the heavenly church. This is what Christ is trying to tell you that each and every one of us has to come to that point. If you want to be a great husband, make sure you're saved first. Because the greatest father can then begin to be the father to you. Wives, you want to be a great wife that is to be Christ-like as well? Be a Christian first. Know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. As you look at what the Bible says in Psalms 103 verse 12. He's removed our sin as far as the east to the west and to the deepest sea. Jeremiah 31 34 says I will remember their sin no more. The Bible also tells us that his, our sin is behind his back. We've all played a game where someone put us something on our back and we had to guess what it said. Why? We can't see it. And they say no looking at mirrors. It's there because there is a principle behind it. We can't see what's behind our back. 
We can't turn our head around on our our neck to see what's back there. We can't. And the Bible specifically says that's where our sin is, behind his back. It's at the deepest sea. It's far from the east to the west. That's great about being in position. When you're saved, he made you absolutely pure. So you can enter into the presence of God, covered in his blood. For he hath made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. You think about this. Jesus Christ knew no sin, yet he became sin for us. God is calling for Christ-like men. And to be Christ-like, we've got to be a child of Christ. But think about what Titus 3.5 says. Titus 3.5. John 5.39 says, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Search the Scriptures. Know if you have a relationship with Christ. Titus 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We first ought to have a positional relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you know, if you were to die today, with 100% assurity, you'd go to heaven as That is the greatest question you could ever have. That is the richest treasure we could ever accept. Do we know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior? Have we ever bowed our head and asked Jesus to be the Savior of our life? You want a great home? You want a great marriage? You want a great country? It starts with us. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Without wavering. We, many people, you ask them, I asked someone yesterday, if you know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, would you go to heaven? Well, I hope so. No, it's not a hope so salvation. It's a no so salvation. You don't have to say, well, I think so, I hope so. That means there is some measure of doubt. You know so or you don't know so. It's either yes or no. It's either heaven or hell. You either know you're going or you have doubts you're going. If you have doubts, let's settle it today. For the Bible says in Corinthians said, today is the day of salvation. We're not going to have the godly families we desire, the blueprints after God's word, if we don't know Jesus. Because how can we profess to know him when we don't? How can we implement his, his plan for a perfect home when we don't really understand the master architect? We've got to know Jesus Christ, our personal Savior. And then, if we do, we've got to live in a daily cleansing. Notice how the washing of the regeneration of the Word is not a temporal thing. It's a permanent thing. Every one of us has a washroom in our house. Everywhere we go, there's a sink. What's the purpose of a sink? So you can wash your hands. Remember our parents? Wash behind your ears and wash your hands. Let me see your hands before you sit down at the table. You know, we're we're to come to the table clean. We're to sit at the table with our family clean. We're to sit with our family spiritually clean. It's a daily thing. And we may take a bath. We may take a shower every day. But do we not still get dirty? Yes. We may get ourselves clean spiritually every day, but we're walking in the world. I saw a neat little article on about a daily cleansing. And it talks about how the Jews would, would actually bathe. They would take a bath, but they would need in the Orient and in the Middle East, a man would get up he would take a wash, he would clean himself, and the idea was that he came to Christ, you would be totally clean. But in the Orient was a lot of sand. So every time they stopped at a residence, they would wash their feet 
before they entered the house because they had the dirt of the road on their feet. They wouldn't necessarily wash the clothes and give themselves a bath, but they would wash their knees down for where the dust would arise before they sat on any furniture. Folks, as we walk through this world, we're going to have the dust and dirt of the world. And we're going to need the washing and regeneration of the Word of God. Hence, if you look at the tabernacle, there was the altar of sacrifice that paid the atonement for sin and the blood sacrifice that was required by God. But then before the priests were ever to enter into the tabernacle, they had to pass by the laver to wash themselves of the blood, of the dirt, of the grime, so that they could enter into the temple of God clean. We are the temple of God. And before we enter into any relationship, earthly or spiritual, we ought to make sure we're clean. We ought to make sure that we're looking in the mirror, as James says. We ought to make sure that we're taking the word of God and saying, Lord, is there any area in my life that would bring a hindrance to your blessing upon my family? We ought to pray, is, is God bringing a distraction um, or excuse me, the devil bringing the distraction in my life that keeps me away from being father the husband the child of God I need to be Psalms 139 23 David cries out search me O God and know my heart try me and know my thoughts Jeremiah 29 13 says and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search me with all your heart Psalm 61 8 says so will I sing praise unto thy name forever that I may daily perform my vows David's talking about keeping the vows of the, co- uh, the covenant of God before him every day. That's why he says, let the word be a lamp unto my feet. Psalm 68, 19 says, blessed be the Lord who daily loaded us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. God wants to be a father. He wants to be the husband to the church and load the church with benefits. He wants the church, he wants you as a leader of the home to be an example of him. You are, husbands, the protector of the home. You are the provider of the home. It's up to you. And your home includes your wife. She is you. You are one flesh. How are you taking care of her? Are you watching out for her spiritual purity? Are you watching out for her physical purity? Are you taking care of her needs? Just as it says here in the book of Ephesians that Christ wanted to provide. He wants to take care of the church. And we as husbands ought to want to nourish and cherish our wives as we do ourselves. Do we ever starve ourselves, men? No. Then why should we starve our wives of the same intention, the same love, and the same compassion we want? The Bible says that Christ loved us before we loved Him. He loved us when we were vile, when we were wicked, when we were sinners on the slave market of sin. He says, I want them. I love them. How much did he love us? This much. He bled and he died for us. Would we be willing to let go everything, men, for our families? If it meant for them to know Jesus Christ, our personal Savior? Would we be willing to let go of everything to make sure our wife has everything she needs spiritually and physically? And forgoing our own benefits? Christ gave up heaven to live the life of a man for 33 and a half years for you and I. Christ gave up the cross or gave up the crown for the cross for you and I. He was ridiculed. Can you imagine the persecution Jesus Christ went through at the end for you and I? And this is the example that he wants for you. And this is something that you see, the caring love. What do we care about, men? Our desire, we ought to desire that our family remains pure. The world will say, oh, that's just, you're so old, you're so outdated, you're so, really? 
when abductions for children are up to sell them for sex slaves, you ought to protect our children. When adulteries and affairs and divorces are up, we ought to protect our family from it. You know what Hollywood does? They glorify it. We ought to flip the channel when that comes on and say, listen, I'm not interested in that. I'm not, I'm not going to promote the world's lifestyle. If I'm not happy with this woman or man, I'm going to go find another one. That's like a used car syndrome. There's nothing wrong with the car that you have. But the problem is the world says, let's trade it in for a newer model. No, the newer model may not work any better than the old model. The world is trying to appeal to your flesh where Christ is trying to appeal to your spirit and say, listen, you made a vow. And what did David says? That I may perform my vows daily. It's hard to keep our vows because the devil's going to bombard them. But the more we are determined and more we are resolute to say, I will not break my vow. When I said to death do us part, when I says I do, when I says I will love her in sickness and health, that means exactly that. You ever thought about that? What if your husband and wife is a quadriplegic? You still don't love them? What if? Your child abandons you. You still going to love them? What if your wife or husband runs off? You just going to find someone else? Or are you going to still be like Hosea and desire and pray? And you know, we serve a big God. Do you realize God is a problem fixer? He can fix any problems. And so can you. You say, how's that? I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. He'll give you the resolute. He'll give you the resolution. He will give you the resolve to say, I can do it. But if God's there, I can do it for sure. Christians, the caring love, we need to have a cleansing love for our family, but we need to have a caring love. What do we care about? What we care about shows in our actions of taking care of our wife and family. When you look at what Christ cares about, he cares about a glorious church. It means intense splendor. He cares about a flawless church. He cares about a sanctified church. He cares about a relational church. If you look at the book of Ephesians, he says he wants to be there to bring unity to the church. Our desire ought to be to bring unity to our family. That doesn't mean being a male supreme chauvinist that says you will do this. She may do it for a while, guys, but let me give you a little inkling of advice. It won't be long. Because God made her who she is. She also has to let God work in her heart. But the two of you, like this picture shows, taking the word of God together and saying, what does God want me to be? Not what the world, the world says, women, you're over here, men, you're over here, the two of you don't get along, and the two of you shoot for the stars and forget each other. No, it doesn't work that way. There's no his and her bank account, his and her bath towels, his and her that. We have a his and hers bath towel, but after every Wednesday, I don't know who's his or hers. He's got the washer and mixed up and put it back on the counter, you know. Doesn't matter. It begins, it makes you want to lead a separate life. But the Bible says you're one. The Bible says God made a help meet. He didn't make a heel bone or a head bone. He made a heel help meet out of your rib bone. She's the protector of your heart, and you're the protector of her. And with daily cleansing and a daily walking with the Lord. You're going to desire to want what God wants for your family. I want us to look at some things in the caring of love. Christ cares about the church and his purity. And he died for it. That the world might become the church. If you look at verse 28 through 30. So it ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth, even as the Lord the church. 
Notice the Bible says we ought to love our wives as our own body. Folks, gentlemen, think about this. You go to work. You perform your best. You do your very best. You have submitted yourself to your boss. And your boss comes up to you and just berates you. And everybody around you, and you knew that you did the best job possible, and it was an awesome job. And your boss said it was garbage. How would that make you feel? You go home, and your wife just made you a great meal, just planted a beautiful flower garden in the front, and you walk right on by it and go, whatever. You just had the same rejection at work, and now you pass it on to your wife. How did that feel to you? How's that going to feel to her? And then you'll say, honey, I want this. Honey, I want that. And you know what she's going to say? Get it yourself. It's not going to go out very well. You got to remember how you want to be treated. You ought to pass it on to how your wife wants to be treated. You ought to love her as you love your own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Love her as you would love yourself. You want priority in your life? Make her priority. The more you love someone, the more you'll want to see her grow. And this is as you look as love as yourself. The first thing, just remember this, love as yourself. Love her as yourself. How do I do that, pastor? Notice that love is not an emotion. When your body has needs, you meet them. Your wife also has needs. You need to meet them too. Even though love is not an emotion, I believe that emotion can follow the meeting of a need. As you meet the needs of your wife, it's going to change your emotional response to her and her to you. Take time to be with her. Even if it's just sitting on the couch, reading a book next to her, be with her. You don't always have to have an activity to do. You don't have to always have a place to go. She may just want some time with the kids gone to bed to sit and just share her day. Listen. Even if there is an awesome sports game on, hit that red little button and go, I'm here for you, hon. Take time to meet her emotional needs. Take time to to love her. Is Christ ever too busy to hear from us? We, not, we need not ever be too busy to hear from our wives. Love, the caring love, takes time. We certainly do not want to ever mar the picture of Christ in the church. But we do. The picture of our marriage is the picture of Christ in the church. Make sure the world sees a good picture of it. Second thing, care is ourselves. Care is ourselves. Love is ourselves, but care. When you want something, you care for it. You take care of that need. Does the Lord care for the church? Does he take care of everything we need? Does not the Bible says, my God shall supply most of your needs? All of your needs. Cast some of your cares upon me. No, cast all your cares. If Christ is asking for the church to put all the cares upon him, should we not say the same for our wives? Honey, load me up. That's why, men, we have broad shoulders. That's why the Bible says in Peter that men, we ought to take care of our wives for they're the weaker vessel. That's not saying that they're weak physically. They can't handle all they can. We can emotionally sometimes. Take care of their emotional needs. Men, they need you. They want you. You know what the devil does? He brings someone at their work that has a listening ear. Every person that I've ever sat down in my office that has stepped out and had an affair on their husband 
has said this. My husband didn't listen anymore. And this guy came along and he showed attention to me and he listened to me and he brought me little things and the devil's sly, folks. Men, make sure your wives are loved up before they leave the door. Make sure their wives are heard up. Make sure they know that at home is where they want to be. It's going to take some work on our part, folks. I'm not preaching to you as a perfect husband. I'm far from it. But we have a perfect Bible, amen? And that's our guideline. Care for us ourselves. My God will supply all. When we look at their needs, they want peace. They want strength. They want wisdom. God gives that all to us. Why wouldn't we want to be there to help answer their questions? This is exactly what God's saying to us. You are to give your wife every single thing she needs. Now maybe she needs to understand the difference between needs and wants. If so, it's your job to help her. To sit down and say, listen honey, this is our budget. Is this something we need or is this something we want? Is our car good for another year or two or three? Is our home good enough? Is our this good enough? We ought to be practical. But what I found out most in counseling and even my own marriage, sometimes my wife is not interested and the wives that I've dealt with are not interested in things. They just want us. And that's what we ought to meet. Something is wrong if you look at your wife as the chief cook, bottle washer, baby wash, babysitter, and partner. She's not. She's more than that. She is a God-given treasure to be cared for, cherished, and nourished. But you know what the Bible says also that it cherished it, but nourished it? It is a fantastic word. It's the Greek word that means to feed to its fullest. Have you nourished your own body and feed to the fullest as you have your wife? What you did provide, is it really what she wanted or what you wanted for her? Men were called to nurture our wives, to bring them maturity and to provide for what their needs is. We are to feed them, provide for them, care for them. And as we look at, as Christ provides for the church, so a husband should provide for his wife. We are to love her and nourish her and make sure that our family remains pure. The Bible talks several times in the book of Ephesians that we are to be followers of God as dear children. We are to walk in love as Christ also has loved us and to give himself for us. For as an offering, a sacrifice to God, we're to not let fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, not to be even named among us. It ought not to be in our homes. It ought not to be promoted. It ought to be even hinted to that way. Parents, remember, our children will mirror us one day. Make sure that it's a good reflection of Christ. Amen. But finally. The Bible says live. As yourself. For no man. Ever yet hateth his own flesh. But nourisheth and cherisheth it. Even as the Lord the church. For we are members. Of his body. Of his flesh. And of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be as joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. Live. How do we live, gentlemen? Do we live like our wife is separate or part of us? We ought to move and think as one. Our kids ought to know that if they ask mom, it's going to be the same answer with dad. If they ask dad, it's the same answer with mom. We're one. Why? We're striving for the best family in the eyes of God. 
We're striving to be that husband that is loving, caring, that wife that is loving and caring so that our children will see mom and dad, they may be strict at times, but they have my best interest at heart. They've been out there longer than I have. They know better. Doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means some of us have been down a road that's been well-traveled. What does Christ care for us like? Why does he meet every need we have? Why is he so wonderfully caring? You think about all of those things about Christ's attribute. He wants the best for us. And we ought to strive for the best for our family. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 tells us that we are joined into Christ. We ought to be joined into our wives as well. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication to every sin that a man doth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. If we start here, glorifying God, living for God, remembering we're not our own. If we've been saved and gloriously saved, then we are bought with a price. And we're going to desire what God wants through us. And that's when you look at the Bible, verse after verse, chapter after chapter, tells of us God's love for mankind. We are to be Christ-like men. We are to love our family unconditionally, unapologetic. We're going to, to stand before God, men, and give account for how we raised our family. We're going to give account how we treated our wives because it is a picture of how Christ treats the church. It better be good. I feel like I'm going to stand for hours giving account for things I didn't do. But what about today? You say, what about the past? We're not worried about the past. Because the past can be corrected today. Because God says he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins. You say, well, I haven't been the husband. Well, you can join the class I'm in. We've all say we can learn more. We can do more. We all can be what Christ would have us be. We are his child. If you're not this morning, your marriage by your marriage, you are either a symbol or denial of Christ in His church. What do your children see? What do your family see when they see you as a couple? Do they see differences? Or do they see people that are willing to work through their differences? That love each other unconditionally? And for all the right reasons. When God says... Let these two to be joined into one flesh. That means we're two individuals that become one. Our hopes and our dreams are not cut apart. They're joined. And our job as a husband and our committal as a husband is to make sure that our wife reaches the stars. That we love her. Just as Christ gave us everything we need to be a successful church. He gave us everything. He says we can have victory through Jesus Christ. He gave us every weapon of uh, warfare we need to fight the devil. To have spiritual victory. There is nothing left unchecked for a defeated church. God wants you to be successful. God wants you to be victorious. God wants you to walk before him. And he says be thou perfect. And he gives you everything in this book to obtain that goal. The problem is when we go home today, a lot of us will put that book on the shelf and not pick it up until next Sunday. How can we live a perfect life before God and walk before him? And the word perfect in Greek is complete. 
How can we walk a complete Christian life that is honoring Christ if we don't pick this book up? How can we have a perfect marriage and be a perfect husband and a complete husband and wife and be a picture of God if we don't pick this book up? This means to be the start of our day and the end of our day and every day in between. Church needs to be an important part of your marriage. Prayer needs to be an important part of your marriage. Devotions, personal and collective, need an important part. Your family needs to see that you are a man of faith. That's what God wants. This morning, God is calling for Christ-like men. Will you answer the call? I know your wives would appreciate it. Your family would appreciate it. But most of all, your Heavenly Father will. He wants you to pick up the cross and follow Him. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior this morning, and if you cannot answer that question, I ask you the first of the service, where would you spend eternity? Heaven and hell. Do you know for sure? It's not a hope so, not a might so. You ought to say, I know. You ought to remember the day you asked Jesus in your heart. It ought to be a day you'll never forget. Do you know Him as your Savior? If you do, will you follow Christ's example of being the husband that God would have you be? Let's pray this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to read and preach thy word. But Lord, as the word of God is preached this morning, may the word of God fall upon hearers and doers of the word. If there's someone that's in the sanctuary this morning or maybe even online watching now, they do not know Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. May this be the morning that they realize that there is nothing more important than a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It is not a prayer that's said to get us out of trouble. It's not a prayer that's said to make us feel better. But it's a change of heart. It's a repentance of heart. And turning from. And following Christ. It's a calling with our mouth. Asking God to save our wretched soul. Lord if there's a father. A husband. In the sanctuary this morning. And they say God help me. I've not been the husband and father I needed to be. Let this be the morning that they say, Lord, I need your help. You're the perfect example of a father. And I want to emulate you. I've not been the husband. I have not led by example. But Lord, today I want to start. I want a great home. I want a home that is pleasing to you. That has peace and tranquility for all parties. God, would you help me? If that is your prayer this morning, may you beckon God to help you perform your vow. Work in hearts, Holy Spirit, as only you can. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around.